Thank you again for watching the film and for sticking around for the Q&A. Really um, you know, it's a it's a kind of a tricky question to answer because it's weird. You know, the you would think a film like this it would take a long time, but this film actually took quicker than other films were much smaller. It took a lot longer than this. So, you know, it's kind of ironic in many ways. Um, the difficulty was not. You know, and, and, and part of that was I had made a short film before this called Yellow Lotus, and it was kind of a precursor to this, also shot in uh, Vietnam, and, and that was a really successful short that, that opened the door to make this film. Um, the difficult part, you know, it kind of came together, I was very fortunate quickly, the difficult part was actually making the film. You know, once we got the green light and we got to Vietnam, then we realized, wow, there was just so much that we were trying to figure out as we um, went along. But, in terms of you know the writing, as I was saying earlier, was during that time period when I was going back and forth to Vietnam a lot. Just um, you know, part of it, I think I was just a, you know college kid, broke, not a lot of money, so I spent a lot of time just wandering the streets and just hanging out with you know I'm you know uh, between the hotels, as they say, and um, and um, and, um, and the stories were born from that. And I just want to acknowledge also I had um, written screenplay. Uh, Michelle Satter at the Sundance Institute had seen my short. And then once he was really next, and it was actually through the Sundance Institute that got everything moving so quickly. So I want to acknowledge myself, Saturn, incredible people at the Sundance Institute for helping uh, move this project along as well. Yes, he went through the Sundance Labs, and that was yeah. really, really important. Before we go, get to another question, we have runners on both sides with cards. If you'd like to ask Tony a question yourself, please raise your hand and write the question, and we'll get to that in the second half. So, Sundance, you won the Grand Jury Prize, the Audience Award, first time ever in history that both had been won by the same film, and of course, the Cinematography Award. How did that change your whole trajectory? First of all, can we just give a hand to Lisa Rindler again? seminars and panels and, and, uh, and a hub for, for Asian filmmakers. 
There was none of that when I was starting out. I remember like one Sundance, and it was just hard to find another Asian at the festival. Forget <laughs> me, you know. It's just like you know, and um, and when you find another, you're like, oh my God, there's another one, you know. <laughs> um, so we've come a long way. So it was very difficult back then, and it was almost one of those things where, you know. Um, it was almost like, oh, we let you do this, we're not gonna let you do another one like this. So after I won those awards, every meeting I took was basically, you know, giving me scripts of projects that I really didn't want to do. So, and I had another script written and said, no, I'm the one who to make it. And it was just, you know, it's one of those, like, we took a chance, thank God we made our money back, you know, now let's take this and, and go do something else. And I just, you know, I wanted to still tell my stories. Very different time here. And I think, you know, all this happening today, I think there was a lot more acceptance for move on to another story with you know Asian leads and Asian stories is you know um, uh, but back then it was this was almost like this experiment that thankfully paid off for them but no one wanted to do it again. So there was a lot of you know you know uh, there was a big gap in terms of what I wanted to do. But um, but we've come a long way and amazing things are happening now so I'm really really happy that to see that. I I actually remember that one of the big well at least for most of us, one of the big key points of the film was that Harvey Keitel was starting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it was, it was basically, I love Harvey, and I think he's amazing as well when he tells a part of a story that's important, you know, and um, thematically, and and, uh, and sort of the, the where Vietnam America was at, at the time. It, it was, you know, that was a lot of that reconciliation was in the news a lot, so his character fit perfectly. But no doubt, it wasn't in our budget, but it was half. You know, um, <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, so his involvement helped get the film made. I tell a quick funny story, uh, and I love Harvey. But you know, so you know, Harvey Keitel, obviously an icon, amazing uh, supporter <coughs> of the arts. He, his involvement in, in Reservoir Dogs helped Quentino, you know, launch Quentino's career, Quentin Tarantino's career, you know, with um, you know, um, and you know, his early films in the seventies helped with Martin Scorsese helped launch Martin Scorsese, and he, his work with Abel Ferrara, so he was an icon, you know, and uh, especially sort of Godfather of independent cinema. And, um, you know, so I sent him the script, never thinking at all he would want to do the film, and I got word back that he wanted to meet, that he wanted to do the film, and I was like blown away, I was like, there's no way in the world, like, yeah, I actually had his like poster up on my wall, you know, <laughs> when I was in school. So I fly to New York, I go meet with him, and, um, and he said, uh, you know, I love your script, I love your writing, but um, I have an idea, Tony. I was like, yeah, great, of course, any idea you want to do. Uh, I want to play the role of the leper, leprosy mom teaching that. <laughs> and I went from being so excited to having a heart drop, and like, you know, I'm so down depressed, because I didn't know what to say at that moment, because I knew his moment would pretty much really like the film, and how do you say no to Harvey Keitel? And there was like this, you know, long silence, and, and I said, you know, and then he saw, you know, he noticed silence, and he said this, he said, you know, you know, we can do amazing things with prosthetics these days. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then I finally said to Harvey, you know, uh, you know, I sent you the script, I thought it was obvious I wanted you to play the role of the one American, you know. <laughs> you know it wasn't really for you to choose which character. <laughs> and, um, and then, you know, but he was really insistent, you know, he's this method actor, he felt like he could do it. And then I said, but Harvey, the film's gonna be in Vietnamese. <laughs> so he finally was like, oh, I didn't know that. I read the English version. Okay, never mind. <laughs> this is so, so thank God that part, you know, talked him out of it. Um, so, but to his credit, I, I, I say that, but I love Harvey. Came to Vietnam, you know, to balance it out, we'll tell you another quick story. So we went there, you know, part of the contract for American actors to get your own trailer. That doesn't exist in Vietnam. You know, actors don't get their own, like, air conditioned trailer or something like that. And none of my other actors got it. And when he saw the other actors didn't have it, he actually gave up his trailer and basically sat under the tent like every other actor wow. in Vietnam and, and, and worked in the same way with them. And then when we finished the film, he asked us to find an orphanage and he donated his entire salary to them for the orphanage in Vietnam. So, wow. so Hooray so, for Harvey. Yeah, so really I was remembering also, I mean, nineteen ninety-nine films by America were not subtitled, even if you went overseas and shot there, usually. Yeah, you know, so I write in English, and, um, and then I actually give it to my mom to translate to me. <laughs> but, you know, when I sent it out to the studio, I sent it out in English. So I had every, basically every studio 
It was like, we want to meet on this, we love the writing, we want to make this film. And everyone, when they found out it was actually going to be in Vietnamese, basically was like, uh, okay, well, we thought it was getting English, we don't want to make it. Until, you know, October Films, which is the independent arm of Universal, um, you know, decided to take a chance on it. And um, wasn't scared about the fact that it was Vietnamese, but. And the um, rest is history. Yes, yeah, it was very, very fortunate. Because it also started changing things. People saw that, oh, we could actually watch a film with subtitles and be entranced by it. Yeah, it was still, I think now, because of Netflix and all these other films coming out, I think the, the subtitles just aren't that big of a deal anymore. But back then, it was a huge deal. And you had a fight between you know, whether the film would be dubbed or would be subtitled. And without a doubt, it would, I would literally, you know, <laughs> I would give my life for the fact that it, I would never let this film be uh, dubbed. Uh, I mean, which the whole reason why I made the film was to hear the actual Vietnamese dialogue, and Vietnamese voices, and Vietnamese poetry, and Vietnamese singing. That was really important to me. This is um, directly related to that from the audience. Great job, Tully. Great job what? Tully. Okay. Tully? Okay. Did you set out to make a musical? The Vietnamese language is so melodic. And was that an inspiration? No, I set out to make a musical, but I wanted to embrace <laughs> the culture. Um, and, um, you know, the, the thing is, you know, what I was alluding to earlier, you know, I grew up watching so much of these American Vietnam War films in which the Vietnamese people were either, you know, in the background, invisible, or running through the jungles being shot at, or the enemy, and, um, and uh, you know, or victims. There were even films that were, where the heart's in the right place, you know, basically the Vietnamese people were just victims. You know, if I wanted to make a film that showed three-dimensional characters, the Vietnamese people could be the protagonist, you know, and um, it could be flawed, but also it could be heroic, and, and um, but also really important for me to, to, to you know, not be the victim, to be the people who are sort of controlling it, you know, you know it, it, or in the sense that they could be, you know, they had some control of themselves and, and, and it wasn't always, a, you know, they weren't there just to um, uh, be seen as being sort of, uh, sort of the byproduct of war, you know what I mean? And um, so that was really important for me. And I wanted to embrace it in its full capacity, so I mean, show the people, show the language, but also show the poetry and then show the music. And, um, and uh, yeah, so early on I knew those were some of the things I wanted to, um, sh you know, to uh, put into the film. Was the music and, and the songs, for example, these were traditional or these were something that you worked with someone to write? Yeah, so they're based on uh, some tr traditional music. Um, and so a lot of the poetry, all the, the, the actual words of poetry are original. So I wrote it in English, I gave it to my mom, who was actually an amateur poet, and she would translate it to Vietnamese and make it better. <laughs> and then I would then you know, look at the English, re edit, give it to my mom, she would then translate back to you know, translate to Vietnamese, tra you know, so we went back and forth and so what ended up being the poetry ended up being this collaboration between my mom and I for you know over many drafts. Um, but it's based on actually the poetry of uh, Hanoi, which is a, a you know well-known, famous poet in Vietnam who, who um, was a leper, and, uh, and a lot of the music is based on Dan Zui, who is a very famous uh, uh, one of Vietnam's you know uh, great uh, music composer. So, uh, but but the lyrics itself are still original. We but we we base it on um, uh, you know tone and textures of things that that, are, that existed. How did you? Your actors, they're absolutely marvelous. Yeah, I mean, so it's very, you know, emotional and bittersweet watching this film. I was going to say off the bat, the sick with Driver, uh, who, you know, is an amazing actor. He's actually my uncle. And, uh, <laughs> um, but it's bittersweet because he. Uh, your family, your whole family was <laughs> involved. That's okay. um, uh, But it's bittersweet because he actually passed away about 10 years ago. So he never got to see the film restored. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it's really emotional, and so it's really tough. You know, it's, and even something like this, you know, I want to take pictures and show my mom, but it's really tough to show her because that's my mom's younger brother, so, you know, and I know it's really tough for her, but. Um, the other actors, you know, we did a huge casting call, and um, um, and we saw, I tell you, the film, like someone could have made a film or behind the scenes of the casting process, because it was absolutely amazing. You know, we, we had, for each of the roles, I think we saw maybe it's like, Five, six hundred people, people from all over Vietnam came by train, sometimes, you know, but they traveled for days and, and just so that they can read for us for like basically a minute and a half. And, uh, and but that time, 
you know, for them, they saw getting into this film, which was an American production, saw like a golden ticket out of whatever they were, you know, going through in their lives. Um, and uh, it's basically each person that, that came and, and we interviewed and, and, and did a bit of a scene for us, we asked them, you know, why are they there, where did they come from? And honestly, the story of that, to me, is just incredible, and it deserves its own film. Um, and, and all the street kids, we saw probably, like, honestly, seven or eight hundred street kids. And uh, some had families, some, you know, at one point we pulled up to the film studio, there was a row of street kids who slept there from the night to the morning because they didn't want to miss their appointment, you know. And, um, and uh, we saw them all, we collected these stories and hope, you know, and, uh, but it was really, um, uh, the whole, that whole process was so emotional and, and, and um, but also it gave us a sense of responsibility that we, we wanted to do, do it right and tell the story with, uh, with care. And, um, and, uh, and that's something that was on my mind you know, every day when I was there. Um, you succeeded. The film portrays your deep love for Japan. Oh, I'm sorry, for Vietnam. What was, <laughs> what was the, <laughs> sorry, no, no. what was the hardest part about portraying? Portraying Vietnam? Vietnam. <laughs> 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 Absolutely okay. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the you know the hardest part on uh, I mean it was hard on different levels. One, you know, on a more practical level, the infrastructure was there was no real film infrastructure at the time. There's a lot more now. I mean, it's still not easy to make a film now, but, you know, but that back then there was real no infrastructure whatsoever. A lot of the equipment we used actually was, you know, old Russian equipment left behind. Um, you know, the sound stage, you know, like, like the, the crane we used was like, like honestly, 1960s. Every, every day I thought like someone was gonna like, you know, it's gonna crash and someone's gonna get hurt. But um, we, um, you know, the, uh, so there are a lot of things we did we were doing for the first time, you know, in the country. And we had to sort of invent new ideas, new ways of doing stuff. And, and um, the other difficulty is we had multiple languages. We had you know, crew from America, we had like 10 or 11 crew from America, crew from Australia, India, Singapore, so everyone got, you know, we had all these multiple languages on set. And um, so it was truly an international collaborative effort. Um, so it was really, you know, so that was, the language issue was difficult. And just trying, you know, I mean, it's a big film done on a really small independent budget. So we had to be like, you know, 46 different locations, location moves. You know, and we shot the thing on, on celluloid, which is very, you know, tough in, in, in that kind of humid, hot terrain. Um, uh, so I think just the difficulty, and then we knew, you know, we, the script was written, it was, uh, you know, we storyboarded it, and we put a lot of time into the, the pre-production, so we knew what we were trying, trying to do, but, you know, I don't think really we saw how just incredibly difficult it would be. But, you know, I think we, we knew every day we were trying to do something really special. It was long hours, and uh, and uh, again, thinking back, I'm not quite sure how we got through it, but we did. And, uh, it's all kind of a blur because you know, we, we uh, gave so much of ourselves into the film, but um, um, and we did because I think we knew we were doing something that was uh, um, that was meaningful and special, and, and, and it's on the screen, so we're really happy about that. Yes. What would you do differently in your way of narrating Vietnam and its working class if you were to do this again? Oh my gosh, that's such a tough question because, I mean, every single time I watch that film, I think about, oh my God, I could have done that differently, I could have done this differently. <laughs> you know, there's a time when I don't watch the film, uh, which I'm not trying to fix something in the film. I'm like, oh my God, that's so, I, I could have, you know, I wish I had more time, you know, developing that or doing this or, you know, but that's, I think, any art form, right? You always say that, you know, the stories, the storytelling, I'm sure it's for any artist, you, it's, you never stop. I mean, it's like you never finish, you just stop, you know? And um, because you can keep on tinkering forever and keep on making little micro adjustments and so on and so forth. And, and, and even when it's complete, you still think about, you know, and I still think about it. Actually, the only time in which I felt like I watched it as an audience member um, was actually at Columbia. When, when, when I started Columbia, you know, uh, you know last uh, fall, uh, the film was played at the Lentest Theater there. Um, that time, there was the restoration was not done yet. It was played. It was shown in thirty five millimeter print, and I had not seen the film for probably, honestly, maybe fifteen years. And who held the print? Who has? No, the so print? there was a print there was, at that time. Was, at that time, Universal had the print, <coughs> yeah. but we didn't know what the negative was. I said earlier, it took us like six weeks to find 
later. But obviously, thought I lost it. But they had a 35 millimeter print. We showed it. I not watched it for probably 12, 15 years. So I actually <coughs> forgot like some of the scene, or, you know. And um, and I, and I got to watch it for the first time ever as an audience member. And it was like the most incredible feeling in the world because I didn't know what to expect. I wasn't trying to correct everything. I was actually kind of amazed. Oh, yeah, we did that. Yeah, we did that. You know. But I was like, I was able to just get deep into the rhythm of the film. You know, that's probably the only one time ever in which I actually watched it, you know, um, freely, just because so much time had passed. Uh, but today I, I was back to, oh my god, I could have fixed that, I could have done that. <laughs> you know, I wish we would have, you know, had an extra tape there, so. How did you get your production designer, Wing Ming, involved in this beautiful film? <laughs> You know, I actually, I uh, actually don't remember. You know, I have to say, it was a long time ago. I don't, I don't remember how we grew up each, each, each. Do you remember? I, I remember when they wrote the script. I thought it was wait, the wait, best wait, script wait, I ever wait, read. Wait, 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 wait. wait, wait. When, you said, <laughs> <laughs> when I read the script, I, I was immediately attracted because I, it was the best script I ever read at the time. It really was. And. Also, as a designer, the fact that to design a tempo on the lake it was challenging, you know, uh, and so it, it was just a great story, and that, that you're attracted to great stories. You know, I was just amazed. You you wrote this script in your twenties, Tony. And it was, it was just that was it. Basically, it was the story, and it, it was just a great script. And I knew I wanted to be involved. <laughs> it was a great script, the story, and the, the fact that you designed a temple on the lake. And that there, there were challenges to that. And there were challenges for all the other things. So, so what we need to look to is that temple and that lake did not exist until we got there. <laughs> you know, it was basically, I mean, the lake existed, we had to dig out more. There was no temple in the middle of the lake. And so we had to build that entire temple. And, um, and I remember one point, like, you know, uh, the production team came to me and says, well, can we just have like a land, like a, like a, like this, like, you know, uh, strip of land that connected, you know, to the temple, which makes it a lot easier. And I was like, it kind of loses the whole metaphor point of isolation and, and, and the lepers, you know, wanted to be in this temple in the middle, surrounded by water. So, but we did, we built the entire temple in a sound stage in Vietnam. And then one other thing with the lake scene, you know, we, um, so White Lotus is like that, don't actually grow in the South. But this, you know, we, we had, we were filming it, the film in the South, so, so I had to film it, you know, film it in the South. And um, uh, so we actually planted lotus flowers three months before. <laughs> and we would shoot all the other scenes, wait till the last week to shoot the lotus scenes when all the lotuses would, would you know, would, uh, would finally grow and bloom. But what I did anticipate is that they die very quickly. <laughs> uh, so we ended up the last second, you might probably remember this way, we had to then build a bunch of fake lotuses, paint them white, stick them into the water. We had like 10,000 fake lotuses. So the irony is it's a film about the, the you know, preserving real lotuses and the fake lotuses. Yeah, and, then, and then piece by piece, we brought all the pieces of, of the temple and built it right in the middle of the lake. And, uh, yeah. and it was incredibly, incredibly difficult and time consuming. Well, if I remember right, um, we didn't shoot anything on the sound stage. No. Oh, yeah. It was built so securely, you know, through your work wing and, and, and the engineers and what, that every scene you saw inside that temple was actually shot in the temple on top of the <laughs> Overboard and to pull down the river. Yeah, they the lotus is by themselves are pretty top heavy, so it, yes. so <laughs> so they would not float that way. I had to come up with a, a, a way of yeah. uh, making them that way. You know, you no no you no lotuses. Uh, they the hollow. Can we give away all of our secrets? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a magic cinema. We have to. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Next question. <laughs>
Um, I think uh, there are some young filmmakers in the audience who aren't part of the Columbia Film School, and they'd like to know. Besides hoods, wait, there's Columbia Film students here? No, I mean oh. maybe there are, but I think these are not, and oh, they are okay. asking you for free advice. Besides Hutzpah, what, what else um, can help a young first-time oh. filmmaker get a film made? And, and Hutzpah and Harvey Keitel, of course. No, no, I would actually say you don't need Harvey Keitel. So, you know, <laughs> the, the, the two things I think are most important. So I actually, I teach uh, film, I teach, uh, I teach uh, at the Columbia School of the Arts. So, you know, and this question is brought to me a lot by the students and, and, um, and I believe in this fully and that is, um, you have to identify early on what your voice is. And I know that sounds like a very sort of obvious answer, but it's not obvious to get it. You know, it's very easy to see a lot of film and just basically say, you know, I want to kind of be like that filmmaker or that filmmaker. And, um, and then in the process of doing it, it's really easy to get lost because you're not actually doing it for your reasons, you're just basically copying someone else's. So finding that voice. And then also when you speak to other people and crew up and get people to believe in you, especially when you're starting out, you have no money. So, so you're basically getting other people to go on this ride with you. And basically you're not paying them, they're gonna probably get in debt trying to make films with you. So, so you have to be able to sell your vision. And so what you're really doing is selling your voice. And, and the fact that you have a vantage point, you have, you have a, a view into something, you wanna say something to the world. And, and it's not about saying the most original thing, because there aren't really any, any original ideas, right? Everything's been done. But it's about, you know, saying something that means something to you. So when I find people to work with, you know, what I find is I try to find people who, you know, are passionate about what they do, what they're doing, and share what they're doing. And like those people, I want to, um, you know, go on a journey with because you know that that we can ride in really difficult times, and filmmaking is incredibly difficult. Um, and uh, and we and you know, it's about and we and then so the people who want to work with you know that they're that that they're in, going to be in good hands with you because because uh, what you're doing, you know. Um, Mean something to you, and that's going to to uh, be felt in every scene and, and and every beat of the film. The other thing I want to say is really important, and this this is not so obvious, and that is what I meant by it's not about trying to find Harvey Keitel to make a film. It's not everyone's going to do that, and I was very lucky, but it's really about looking to your peers. And I say this all the time. I say, you know, if you're if you're in film school, look to your peers. These are the people you want to grow with and rise with and lean on each other. You know, help the people around you lift them up, and once your turn to make your film, they can lift you up and, and rise together. It's not about trying to find that famous person over there, you know, and then hook on whatever you know shine they have to help you know help get some of that shine. No, it's about shining with the people who are starting out and rising together and finding this incredible tribe of, of artists that you can lean on and work together with. I'm telling you, that's gonna get you through everything. So, um, so besides, you know, teaching in the School of Arts, I'm, I'm arts in residence at the Weatherhead East Asian Institute at Columbia, and um, and I have to give a quick shout out because uh, the Weatherhead, is, Weatherhead Institute was instrumental in helping me uh, uh, restore the film. I had a very short amount of time when, when it was accepted by Sundance to do it, and um, and uh, it was working with them. Uh, I was able to then, uh, you know, uh, get the initial seed money to start the process. And, and there's something about once someone steps in, it makes it real. And then from that, other people step in. One people stepped in and started giving the money to help with the restoration. So um, so uh, really, really thankful for that. So, um, you know, so Columbia had a hand in helping get this made, which I'm really proud of. Um, uh, but so anyways, um, my next film is, uh, which I'm working on as, as uh, during my artist residency is about the famous napalm photo. And uh, it's a photo that was taken in June 8, 1972 by Nick Uth, who was the only Vietnamese uh, to win the Pulitzer Prize during the Vietnam War. And, um, uh, and I want to say, which is a huge emotional um, honor uh, that we were able. So when he won it, he shot the photo in 1972, he won the Pulitzer in 1973. And the Pulitzer, as we know, was given out at Columbia. And he was not able to come to New York at the time because of the war. So he was never able to come and accept this award. And we were able then, 
this year to hold an event, 50, you know, 50 something years, 51 years later, we were able to bring Nick U to Columbia, and we did a panel discussion with him in Pulitzer Hall, where he would have been 50 years ago, but he wouldn't even get the chance. So he came, we did a conversation with them, and the little girl from the photo came, folk, she came as well. And, uh, and it was just an amazing, meaningful event in, uh, in Pulitzer Hall, Columbia. So we were able to do that this year. And, um, but my next film is really is about the, the day that photo was taken. Uh, it's not really about the photo, it's about the day uh, from multiple perspectives. Nick, Kim Fook, the little girl I've been working with closely on the film, and a few other characters, and, 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 it's, and it's about how all these characters, um, uh, you know, have all these separate lives, and, and the sort of the, the, the forces that, you know, um, push them little by little to intersect that day when that photo was taken. And that photo in the end sort of the glue that, that connects all these stories. Um, yeah, so that's my uh, next one. We hope you don't have any struggles <laughs> casting this time. And we look forward to that. You have to tell us what's going to happen with three seasons. What's next? Are you going into the Oh yeah, so yeah, so we've been very fortunate this film's had this, you know, second light, the play of Sundance, play at the Udine Arts Film Festival, it's playing here, it's playing some Sony, it's playing a lot of different festivals around the world. And, uh, and once that's done, we, uh, we plan to, now that we have, you know, a 4K <laughs> digital version of the film, we can finally now, we can finally now have it, uh, <coughs> uh, you know, either through a, we're gonna sell it through either a streaming platform, to Blu-ray and all that, but we're gonna work through all that. And uh, the film now can be seen by, people at home and, and all over the world, which, which we could not be done. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.